good looking, <laughs> independent, successful, and a leader. Thank you so much, Heng, for that beautiful, warm welcome and introduction. And thank you very much, Mercy Malaysia, for inviting me. The theme is about, you know, uh, Mercy Malaysia is now 20 years old, and what should we be looking at? And I, th I think we've got to start looking forward much more and not just look back. It's easy for, for founders to look back and talk about the good old days, but actually, no, we have to be looking forward and what is it that's coming that we may not be aware of and may not be prepared for. And, you know, to, to do it at your 20th anniversary is really at the right time as you rethink, you know, what does the future hold for not just Mercy Malaysia, but the humanitarian sector at large. You know, one of the um, opportunities that I've had working with the International Federation now in Geneva is to be able to uh, lead the team in developing the next 10-year strategy. And when we were trying to do this, one of the things we said is, do we build an organization for today or tomorrow? And in order for us to, do an, to build an organization for tomorrow, we need to be able to look at what tomorrow might bring and what are the trends that are telling us uh, and the changes that are happening. So I also encourage that you do that because we need to be able to better respond to the challenges of the 21st century, which will look very, very different from what we were looking at when we started Mercy Malaysia. So of course, I'm also technically challenged. So, let's start. So we know the world has changed. Everyone talks about it. The world is changing, things are shifting. But what is very alarming is the rate and the pace of change. And that what is happening now in current times is the acceleration of change that is much more complex, much more interconnected, much more dynamic. And it is seeing now, we're seeing far greater leaps in education, as Elizabeth has mentioned earlier. You know, this is really, in my opinion, the foundation of everything we do. So whether it's humanitarian work or development work or business, you know, education is fundamental. And education today is not just formal education as we know it, it's also the very non-formal education. We see great advances in technology. We see changes in connectivity and networks that we've never seen before. We see dramatic shifts in systemic power. And we've see, experienced this you know, all over the world and also in our country, the pushback of institutionalized structures to more distributed and networked systems. The growth of movements driving social change away from institutions. And this, is something that we will see much more. Demand for people who are marginalized, disenfranchised to be heard and to be seen. Now for organizations like Mercy Malaysia, like the Red Cross and Red Crescent where I work now, this is very, very important because you may not, or you, you will face challenges in actually recruiting volunteers. Uh, for an organization like Sunway University, it's not difficult because your volunteers come from your student base. But for larger organizations and institutions that are very dependent on volunteers, right now, people are so empowered that they can take a plane, take a couple of people, do their own thing, go to Lesbos, set up a kitchen, whatever. There is no requirement now for institutional loyalty. And this is quite a problem. It's a problem for institutions like Nursing Malaysia, like Red Cross and others. But it's also a problem in the sense that there is poor understanding of what values are, what are the principles, and sometimes chaos can ensue. And the biggest problem, I think, is when we don't really listen to what people want. And the biggest problem is when we don't give affected people what they actually need. And this can only come with understanding some of the basic fundamental principles of humanitarian action. And I'm very delighted that Nassim Malaysia will spearhead this in the country, in the region, and continue to do that. We need to be able to be the, the organization that empowers now. We find ourselves at a moment that while development outcomes are improving, 
we see now the Sustainable Development Goals as a, as a target that we're looking at. Well, we're seeing huge challenges and a lot of the development that is actually going on is coming at a very high cost. Inequality is increasing and frequently resulting in vast amounts or large populations unable to have a good life. Climate risks are accelerating. Without a doubt, the greatest threat, threat we're facing today is climate threat. And these are actually threatening our existence. The complex combinations of populations and demographic transitions, the growth and complexity of cities, the youth bulge in some developing countries and an aging population in others, and middle-income countries facing the squeeze, it's fast-changing uh, in the fabric of society that we live in and driving the transformation of communities. So, this is in contrast to a world where new technologies, networks, power distribution and movements are driving social change and creating possibilities for collaboration and connection that was unimaginable a decade ago. I was just thinking as I was, right, I was driving the team on the strategy for organization for the next 10 years, how I would have felt in 1999 was, had there been Twitter or Facebook or social media. And I'm sure Mr. Malaysia would be a completely different organization now if that was in existence in 1999. So these changes, this technology and their associated social changes are now permeating across the globe. We all know that. They drive monumental shifts, touching the multiple elements of our lives simultaneously. Social media, big data, self-driving cars, solar panel sunroofs, like in some way, GPS, iPhones, human genome project, genetic engineering, Amazon, Alibaba, all the different video streaming services, Uber, Airbnb, they all emerged to prominence only within the last 10 years. And that is how rapid change has been. So whether we like it or not, whether we are ready for it or not, the future is upon us and we can no longer attend to work as though the status quo will continue. And yet, I would say many of us, or many institutions, and many leaders are trying to solve 21st century problems with 19th century solutions. How we work as humanitarian organizations, how quickly we make decisions, the systems and the processes we use, the programs we design, in a large part, are out of step with the changes happening more broadly in the world. We run the real risk of not being relevant in the 21st century if we are unable to adapt and be able to respond to these changes. I now work at the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, and we are 100 years old this year. We take pride that we are in 191 countries around the world with about 13.7 million volunteers. Our re relevance is being threatened every day, and this is why we have really invested in looking at futures and foresight to really think about how do you maintain that relevance? How do we grow our volunteers? Do we even need to grow it? Do we really need to count our volunteers? How do we measure our impact in society? So, as I mentioned before about change, and we have to remember what the business world itself has experienced, and Jack Welch, who was the CEO of um, GE, once said, if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate, rate of change on the inside, then the end is near. And I think this applies also to civil society organizations, to large institutions, and I dare say, even to governments. But in order for us to really think about how we move forward, we need to be able to 
It's about asking the right questions. And sometimes it's so difficult to ask the right questions because we're not comfortable with change. But it really does shape the world by the questions that we ask. So we decided to ask ourselves, how is the world changing? What is actually happening? And we did an entire trends analysis, which is now being used by many organizations in the world, and you're welcome to use it too, if it's relevant. And what we looked at, you know, the trends and transformations around the world, and we found nine major trends that, that are happening. And you'll see this in the chart, and I'll try to go through it in a little bit. But any mega trend analysis done to date can only talk about multiple factors that we are changing. However, it isn't necessarily the trend itself that is different. When we talk about trends, how can we, how can we not talk about them in a network way and avoid talking about them in silos? The issue of our times is that convergence and complexity is the norm. We cannot expect to have a conversation about climate without talking about how people are connected to each other, without considering issues of conflict and how people choose to move. All this has relevance to climate. So let me walk through some of the thematic areas that we have started to identify as the biggest trends and transformations that we'll be facing in the next 10, 20 years. The first area is around violence and poverty. And when we look at violence and poverty, we are seeing now a real swing. When we started the humanitarian sector, you know that the Red Cross was the founding of the humanitarian principles. It was born out of conflict, the Battle of Solferino. And then we swung, we had earthquakes, tsunamis, and all sorts of other hazards that resulted in disasters. And by the way, I'm allergic to the word natural disasters, because there's no disaster that's natural. So it's actually disasters arising from natural hazards, and because man is not able to reduce vulnerability. But right now we swing back to a situation where we have prolonged civil conflict. Can anyone in this room shout out a number of how long is the average age of displacement today? Seventeen. It's longer than that now. Seventeen is a good answer, but right now they're looking at about 20, 21 years. In the standard number was given was 17. Yeah, Happy is a good student. <laughs> so, so it is a real problem because there will be children who never experience home. There will be young people who have never experienced what it's like to belong to a country. And we don't have to look far. It is also on our shores. You go to Sabah, you'll see a lot of kids who are no, not registered, they have, no, they have no sense of belonging. And yet, we want a world that has peace and acceptance and tolerance. We need to examine ourselves very carefully <coughs> on these areas. Terrorism, radicalization, Israel. So anyone who says it's a conspiracy, I beg to defer. It is real. But it's not an isolated terrorism. It's born out of all these colliding complexities and challenges of poverty, of climate, disenfranchisation, a sense of inequality, injustice. We also see a rise in populism and nationalism, which is worrying. And I don't need to mention that any further. You know what I mean. <laughs> Last mile poverty. Poverty is now no longer in rural settings. It's mainly in urban slums. We're seeing now poverty at our doorsteps. And yet, sometimes we don't open our eyes wide enough to acknowledge that. And then, cyber violence. This is now becoming a major, major issue that is actually going to grow, in my opinion. So, even though development standards may be improving overall, by 2030, deep poverty will increasingly be concentrated in countries affected by fragility. Now, this is a big problem for humanitarian actors, particularly if you work in fragile states and chronic vulnerabilities and countries affected by poverty and conflict. 
But what next? What about the future urban battlefield? What are the implications of new technologies? We're not talking about robocops and cyber warfare and, and all that, but we've already started seeing drone wars. This is real. Many of you know I'm a huge Star Wars fan. But when I look at Star Wars, I learn a lot. I've been trying to convince my boss to watch Star Wars. He's never seen it. Because I said there is a philosophy behind Star Wars. And one of the universities in, in the UK actually have a course on Star Wars. So, Elizabeth, I'll be very happy to teach that. Um, <laughs> but the future of conflict, right, whether it be urban, cyber, autonomous weapon capabilities, and human modification, this is coming. This might seem very far away. It actually is here. So we see drones being used in violence and already human modifications experimented with. And this is worrying. In the past few years alone, myths and misinformation have resulted in outbreaks of measles and mumps, those of you who know the anti-vax um, movement, and the stubborn persistence of polio in some of the countries in the, in, in the Asia, in, in fact, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and also now in Nigeria. They have contributed misinformation and um, myths to the deaths of about 11,300 people due to Ebola in West Africa. Currently, my organization is working in DRC, in a very, very complex area in DRC, where there is an Ebola outbreak. And part of the biggest problems we face is that people don't want to come for treatment because they believe that this disease was brought there by the governments in a complex environment. It's brought there, you know, because they say, well, we had cholera, we had poverty, we had malnutrition, we had all sorts of things that made us very sick. But none of you were here. And now, when there's Ebola, we see everyone you know, running around in white vans and nice big cars. So this disease was brought by all of you. How do we tackle this misinformation? So we now, as a humanitarian organization, have to have a subspecialty sort of understanding of how to handle social media and misinformation. And we work with CBC with a platform that actually handles rumors. And because we're able to do that, we can actually really increase the number of people we're able to treat. But these are the things we need to start thinking about. We never had to think about them before. False facts have the power to maim children, kill health workers, we all know this, and stoke, stoke public health disasters. We see the impacts of hate speech in real life violence. We see it in Germany, and just recently, we've seen some mass shootings in the US. And we've seen it also in India. And the case in India was a very unfortunate one, where two men were named on WhatsApp as having kidnapped a young girl and assaulting her. The men's identities and home address were spread like wildfire on WhatsApp. It mobilized so much community anger that people tracked the men down and lynched them. It turned out that the information was spread on WhatsApp wasn't true. But the men are innocent. So this is what is happening in the world today. We receive so many messages and on Facebook, on WhatsApp, hardly verified, and then it spreads like wildfire all sorts of gossips, all sorts of attempts to, you know, humiliate people, whatever. But I think this is the world we live in, and this is something that we have to be aware of. The second area is around climate and resources. And Elizabeth very nicely point, painted in her presentation about what the university is doing, what every institution should be looking at as well in terms of climate and resources. But climate-related displacement is a real issue. We're seeing more and more people displaced. We, we have problems with waste. We were talking about diving. I'm a big diver, diving fan. And while I would have loved to watch the turtles and 
all sorts of lovely creatures under the sea, I'm told now to stop diving in certain parts of the world because you'll be so disappointed that you'll only see plastic. So geoengineering, co-modification, resource rights as advocacy, the rights to water, the rights to energy, all the different resources that require and access to clean water. The bad news is the end seems to be near. The planet has only until 2030 to stem catastrophic climate change, experts warn. And the latest results of the, of the group working on the IPCC and others of the climate activists predict that by 2050, if we don't reverse the global warming, um, the Earth is uninhabitable in the end of the world. So whether through extreme heat, extreme weather events, a never-ending cycle in biodiversity collapse. So because of that, as, as mentioned, if no action is taken, there will be more than 143 million climate migrants across this region. In the sub-Saharan region, um, there will be a predicted 86 million South Asia, 40 million, Latin America, 17 million. People are still arguing what to call them, climate refugees, climate migrants, whatever. But basically, they're people vulnerable, and they have to move. Some of you may be aware, the islands in the Pacific are being inundated by water now. I refuse to call them small island developing states. I feel it's a bit demeaning. I call them large ocean states, islands. And I remember meeting one of the rulers of the islands and he was saying in Tuvalu, he was saying that, sorry, in Kiribati, he was saying that, you know, they've bought land now in certain parts of Fiji so that they can start moving. So imagine this, that you have to move because of a, a rising sea level. Your entire history, your entire culture, how does that become now something you can tell your children when you actually have to move your entire community to another country, basically, and have a piece of land there. So these are the real issues, not just in terms of the vulnerability and the people moving, but of culture, of history, the psychological impact of all this. And there is a real uh, a phenomenon now on climate-related depression and, and psychosocial issues, because these are very, very depressing for many people, and this is why people are in the street. Well, closer to home, Jakarta is already sinking about 1 to 15 centimeters a year. And it's already planning very cleverly to move the capital from Jakarta as the city is going to struggle with not just pollution and traffic gridlock, but also because of the sinking city. So climate change will actually make some parts of South Asia unlivable by 2100. 4% of South Asian populations is expected to experience temperature and humidity conditions that humans cannot survive in without air conditioning. Three quarters of the population will experience environmental conditions considered dangerous, even if not downright unlivable. Elizabeth was in Geneva when I was here. I came back for a very brief uh, meeting. And unfortunately for her, and fortunate for me, I came home to Malaysia that was cooler than Switzerland. <laughs> the problem with living in Europe is the lack of air conditioning. So those of us who've lived there before know that, you know, for example, in where I live, it's, un it's not even allowed to have air conditioning in the houses. So, you know, they have to change now. You know, urban uh, policies have to change because it's just so hard. So the third area I want to focus on is around new communities. The notion of community is changing. The very makeup of communities and societies is shifting and challenging our collective understanding of identity and belonging. So inequality, migration, mobility, polarization, Online communities, the youth bulge versus aging population, these all contribute to the sense or the lack of identity sometimes, or multiple identity that a lot of people are struggling with. 
And as I mentioned before, if you're going to be living in a, in a camp or a refugee situation for all your life until you're adult, then how do you then identify, how is your identity going to be defined by? Now, we are growing. 2.5 billion people will be added to our population by 2050, with 90% of this increase concentrated in Asia and Africa. And this is not a good thing. It's controversial to talk about population growth and population management, but the, this is going to result in a lot of problems for sustainability. One of which is going to affect us as well here is that one in three people will be living in cities, but a lot of people around the world, particularly in Asia and Africa, will be in informal settings. And this is where there's a problem. When you talk about poverty, when you talk about disaster risk reduction, when you talk about humanitarian response, it's very difficult in these kinds of settings. If you look at the refugee population or Syrian population uh, who are refugees in Jordan or Lebanon and Turkey, they don't just live in those camps that everybody goes to visit them. In fact, that's a drop in the ocean. ocean. The majority of refugees actually live among host communities. And what happens is that there is also competition within host communities. There's, you know, there's all sorts of uh, conflict and, and tensions that will arise, a lot of misunderstanding as well. So th it's really a, a perfect storm. In 2018, one of the studies done by Oxfam predicted, and, uh, and this became a big controversial issue, that 26 people in the world have the same wealth as the poorest 50% in this world. So this inequality, this injustice, where some very, 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 very rich people do not even have to pay taxes, is where and what, what fuels this anger on inequality and injustice. But this is the world we live in today. It's also a world where 244 million people are actually living outside their country of birth and contribute to that statistic. And that's 3% of humanity. This is projected to keep increasing. It's not entirely a bad thing, but it's something to think about, that actually the whole question of identity, of citizenship, this is going to really challenge our conventional thinking. So let me share with you a little bit of demography and social change in a region where one might say is pretty stable, you know, the Middle East and North African region, they're quite, you know, homogenous, so to speak, you know, they're old civilization and so forth. But it is actually going through a lot of changes. Youth unemployment in the Middle East and North African region is actually among the highest in the world at 28%. So you can imagine that one in four young people in the Middle East and North Africa are unemployed. And then, remember my first uh, few slides around the rise of terrorism and, and all sorts of violence. And by 2030, elderly nationals will form about 20% of the GCC population, the Gulf countries, compared to only 2% today. We're talking about an 26, uh, sorry, 20, 18% rise in the course of 10 years. The next area is around financing. Now, this is very important for those in the humanitarian and development or aid sector. When we found it less in Malaysia, it was really to catalyze. Um, let me look back at history just a little bit. When I wanted to be a humanitarian actor, so to speak. I didn't think it was going to be forever. I just wanted to go to help. But there was no organization, at least public organizations in Malaysia, that were interested to even respond to my emails. But those days, emails were new. But I wrote as well. And, um, and then I, I, I went to, on to contact Medicine Song Frontier. And I said, I'd like to volunteer. And they said, yes, please do. I said, I want to go for six months. I'll pay for myself. But I always say that, you know, I'm a very obedient Muslim wife. My husband said, why don't you start an organization? So I said, okay, 
Um, uh, and, he, and, and, uh, and what he said was, and I think it's really important, he said, um, you know, if you build an organization, then many Malaysians will be, who are like you will have something to go to. And, then, and I said, no, but it shouldn't just be us. It should be many organizations aspiring to become good global citizens because surely Malaysia's development cannot be measured by our highways and our shopping malls and our GDP. It has to be measured by the conscience of the people, and that to me is true development. So the rest is history. So I always felt when I started, it was to plant a seed and to catalyze, and I'm very happy to see many organizations now doing humanitarian work inside and outside the country. But coming back to financing, this causes an increased competition. Whereas I had the privilege and fortune to be one of the few organizations Faisal now has to lead an organization that, where there are many other organizations in competition, which requires a lot of new thinking and new approaches to financing. So, when people look at humanitarian assistance, and I'm talking about the larger organizations, because you know I've worked in the UN and also with the, with the Red Cross, Everyone talks about this beautiful global humanitarian assistance report, overseas development assistance, and so forth. That's a drop in the ocean. It's a drop in the ocean compared to what is available in domestic resources. It's a drop in the ocean as compared to what is being invested in impact investments and social entrepreneurship. So unless and until we're willing to think without a box, and not put ourselves within the constraints of Western organizations looking at overseas development assistance as a prime source of income, then you will be in trouble. Now, when we started Mercy Malaysia, 0% international funding. Every single resource was local. And it was from people, some of whom are in this room, who went out and talked to people, sold all sorts of things, did all sorts of little projects and the Malaysian public being able to understand and take pride in an organization that they could call their own. You have to relive that. You have to really reignite domestic fundraising in the country and not be dependent on overseas development assistance. My role in the Federation now is really helping 190 national societies try to mobilize domestic fundraising as much as possible, while at the same time trying some innovative approaches around uh, impact investments and so forth. So this changing aid flows, the rise of FinTech, is providing us great opportunities. Also, the area around humanitarian financing now is being widened, and now this is a fantastic phenomenon. International aid workers and international humanitarian systems phenomenally good at inventing all sorts of things, and now there's a humanitarian development nexus and a humanitarian development peace nexus, and soon there'll be a humanitarian development peace climate nexus, and so on and so forth, but without any resources, so it's all talk, right? So as an institution, you have to ask yourself how are you relevant, what are your skills, what do you bring, and how are you different? What is your differentiating factor? Islamic finance is one such area that is going to be very important. But coming back to data, the humanitarian financing fell short by 38% consistently, and you know, aid to least development. Now the problem now, because there's so much humanitarian crisis and protracted crisis, the, the, the least development countries that are quite dependent on development aid are also suffering because there's only a certain amount of resources that are available. And donors are becoming generous, but still there's never enough, because the needs just increase. So I think we've got to start you know, looking at these areas very carefully and really re-examining how we look at financing as well. So we talked about the Sustainable Development Goals, and the UN estimates that for developing countries, um, to, to be developed country, to achieve the SDGs, we require about 2.5 trillion US dollars a year to achieve it. It is impossible with current financing approaches. And this is why a new look at how you achieve SDGs through innovative financing becomes very critical. 
So we've now reached the cusp of what I'm excited about most, about the innovative financing revolution, really leveraging on fintech, blockchain, remittances, mobile money, and so forth. And remittances in uh, 2016, in, around the world, was three times greater than aid that is received through a regular overseas development assistance. So, I'll move on to power and governance, but just to say, there is a special session on financing tomorrow that I will be sharing some of our work. So if you're interested, please come to that. On power and governance, I mentioned about how people are disenfranchised and power and institutions become less and less relevant. And we have to ask ourselves, where does power actually reside today? Is it in the same places we've assumed that it has been before, or is this shifting? Many of my friends in Europe is telling me the decline of Europe and the rise of Asia is really pushing them to and challenging them in ways that they've never imagined. I'm talking about people in the development sector and the aid sector. The rise of the economy in Asia, Africa as, an, as, a, as, an, as a continent it has huge opportunities. So I think that you know, we will have to look at um, this whole area around mistrust in institutions we have to look at new forms of democracy and the geopolitical power shifts. And those of you who are on your mobile phones, that is where some of the power sits. Right? One tweet, one WhatsApp message going viral about anything that the government or any government does that you don't like can actually create a bit of a seismic shift in many of the things that are happening in the world today. So at the World Economic Forum this year, a group of people sat down and said, okay, let's re-examine re examine now you know, what is humanitarian response for the 21st century or even today. You know, these were people from tech companies, social media activists, investors, philanthropists and corporations now taking up action in humanitarian aid and traditional humanitarian organizations do not know how to work with that. <coughs> and emerging actors. Again, the advice for Muslim Malaysia is, Muslim Malaysia has had huge, by leaps and bounds, comparative advantage to any other organization in the world in how to work with private sector. Leverage on that. Teach people how to do that. We talked about governance and governments and about how nationalistic and populist governments have emerged. But do they really matter? Well, in one country, called the United States, when the government denied climate change and refused to sign um, the accord, 350 mayors came together and said, we'll sign it. We will implement you know, what is required on climate change uh, without even the government uh, approving it or even signing on it. So are cities exerting greater power than federal governments. And this is something that is actually emerging quite a lot in the West. The future of civil society. I mentioned earlier about lack of trust in institutions. The Edelman Trust Barometer is a very interesting tool. It's produced by Edelman, and what they do is they measure trust among a, a variety of organizations. And what they found is that trust is on a major decline. Trust has declined globally in 10 out of 15 sectors surveyed, including civil society. And the trust in institutions, governments, media, is at an all-time low, as well as civil society organizations. So communities are now facing prospective futures where they feel increasingly unheard and do not trust institutions and systems that play a role, that supposedly play a role in framing their lives. We talk also about the whole issue around governance and, solid, and, and sovereignty. So you would have heard that in the recent tsunami in Sulawesi, the Indonesian government said, we can do this ourselves. We can take care of our people. We don't want new foreign workers to come. And, and yet, 
you know, Faisal knows this very well, 20 years of my life has been pushing for the rise of the global south and for localization. And I look at them and I say, and why are you surprised? So people like me and a few others in this room were pushing this agenda that aid should be as, and assistance should be as local as possible and as international as necessary. You shut us down and you shut us up when we started saying this, but now the whole world is waking up. So this is actually what's happening now. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? It depends. Right? When there's a, a state that is capable of taking care of its people, is not belligerent to its people, then it is a good thing. But I also believe that the combination and collaboration between different organizations, both national, local, as well as international, is important for learning. And at the end of the day, if the world is changing so fast, if we don't start to learn from each other from now and challenge our own thinking, we'll wake up in a very lonely place. The other area I'd like to talk about is the future of health. So we are seeing now health not just becoming a consequence of disasters, but also a disaster in itself. And we're seeing pandemics uh, and epidemics in Bangladesh now, you know, as a result of the floods, there's a massive rise in dengue. But even in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, there's high incidence of dengue. And it has a high mobility and mortality rate. We have aging populations around the world. In Malaysia too, we are aging very, very quickly. I spoke at an EPF uh, conference on social security, and one of the biggest challenges we will face is, is the EPF money that we're supposed to withdraw when we retire even enough to help us go through old age? Probably not. Health systems are changing, digital health, health innovation, and also the rise in non-communicable diseases. We are the fattest country in the world. I'm great evidence for that. <laughs> but, um, but you can't help it, right? The food's so good. Um, <laughs> but I think that, you know, the reality is we are moving towards one where we have, uh, you know, a problem with the rise in NCDs, non-communicable diseases. So why are we at even more risk than ever of a global pandemic. If you look at the history of the world, scar um, scarlet fever and the Spanish flu, you know, decimated large amounts of populations in the world. The future for us is actually not if there is another pandemic, but the question is when. And therefore, we need to be able to look at how we prepare and how we predict and how better to use data uh, in looking at this. So the World Bank estimates that the annual cost, the annual global cost of moderately severe to severe pandemics in the world today is about $570 billion, about 0.7% of our global income. That's a large amount of money. Most economic losses are not typically caused by the disease itself, but rather by consumer reactions labor and equipment shortages, and cascading failures in tourism, retail, financial, and other sectors. And we've seen this, not just with the Ebola crisis in Africa, but you will remember as, uh, in 20, I think it's 2012, uh, when there was a massive flood in Thailand, um, and the whole price of computers went up by 1%. None of you noticed it, but it did, because the parts uh, were coming from Thailand and therefore they weren't reaching the Japanese in time, and therefore you know, the, the motherboards and all these things couldn't be done at the right time, so the prices all went up. So we're all impacted, whether we like it or not. The world is so global now. I mentioned before about aging, I'll say it again. By 2015, for the first time in our history, seniors over the age of 60, oh, I hate that word, um, <laughs> will outnumber children under the age of 15. Most countries are not prepared to support a swelling number of elderly people as they lack basic social protection and income, health care and housing for senior citizens. So if you're really smart, you start looking at public housing for senior citizens now as a business. 
Coming back to the health sector, there's projected to be a significant shortage of health workers estimated to reach 80 million by 2030. And this is a WHO prediction. And the future of work is one about merging talent with technology. I'm smiling and I'm looking at Shaveen here, who's leading on this right now. And what is holding us back in looking at the future of work, the whole gig economy, the whole way we look at future human capital? I think we've got to start re-examining now. Are doctors even really necessary, to be honest? Right? In some places, yes, in some, in some, some areas. But now, University of Malaya has discovered this rose thing where you can actually do cervical pap smears on your own, right? So, and, and transmit the, the results and so on and so forth. But, you know, there is a real uh, importance for us, particularly us in the medical profession or those who are still in the medical profession, to start looking at, you know, how does technology bridge, you know, some of these changes that are required in the medical profession, how we have to relook at the way we work. The good news, if you like, is that Asia has a surplus of doctors. As you know, in Malaysia, you can graduate as a medical doctor and not have a job. Come and work with us. Let's see Malaysia or Federation or whoever. But it actually, I think, is an opportunity because if there is a global shortage, why aren't our doctors brave enough to get out of the country and work where doctors are needed? I think this is something is about mindsets, it's about you know shifts in how you think, you know, how do you allow yourself with a medical degree to just sit and sell going pisang or whatever. But and I know people are doing that, right? I'm not demeaning it, but I'm saying that why can't we be brave enough to rethink you know, the value of medical education which is so valuable in many parts of the world that don't have doctors. So I think these are huge opportunities for Asia we need to start looking at. The bottom line is what the mosaic of trends and emerging change shows us that we have, we see contradiction and conflict with each other. And logic and what we thought was the status quo and what we thought to be true, our assumptions of humanitarian need and human environment, it doesn't necessarily hold true anymore for the 21st century. We need a complete reimagining of our systems, our cultures, our structures and our behaviours in order to be able to navigate the very complex decade ahead of us. I only say decade because I'm quite old, I don't want to think about 20 years, I'll think about 20 years if I cross another five. Um, but it is a real, real worry that we're not thinking in the future. And we have to do this so that we can ensure we're truly not leaving anyone behind. We may have blind spots, or we are we even prepared enough to look at the future, or brave enough to look at it. An integral, uh, an integral component of being prepared for the future is on ensuring, ensuring that we have the right forms of leadership that is suitable for the 21st century. And are the forms of leadership that have gotten us today, here now, fit for the future? So. I believe very strongly, oops, okay, this is now here, skip one slide, ah, I'm going to do this, right, let's talk about technology, it's not in my notes, because I edit this, so I wanted to tell you a story about technology, because I see a lot of people on their gadgets, and we can't live without them, right, in, in the olden days, when my parents were going out, they'd have to check where their car keys and where their spectacles were. Now we have the first thing we ask is, where's my phone? <laughs> right? Yeah. Good. At least we're honest enough, right? <laughs> so, let me tell you a story. I'll tell you this story because I'm sure all of you can identify with this. So Greg is a security, security officer working in a clothing factory in outside London. So one day, he writes an email to his boss to say, I would like to take a holiday, and I need to take leave from this day to this day. And off, switched off. He's a night security, so he went home. The boss woke up in the morning and 
replied to the holiday, being unsure, unclear whether the holiday was approved, but forwarded it to every single staff in the factory. So, was inundated with that. The staff then said, did Greg get a holiday? Someone started a Twitter hashtag, give Greg the holiday. <laughs> and it went viral. And what happened was, even the factory across the road had in their windows, give Greg the holiday, so that the CEO could look at it. That wasn't enough. VO5 said, you know, what happened, well, we'll um, no. one of the, a travel agent said, we'll give you a holiday to Las Vegas, and whatever happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. But VO5 said, we'll make sure your hair is good, and uh, some of the companies wanted to give him designs, and Thomas Cook uh, said, enjoy Vegas, anyone want to join him, they use it as an opportunity to also advertise their tour company, and so on and so forth. And poor Greg didn't know what was going on, came to work the next day and realized that you know everybody was talking about this holiday. Uh, but of course, he's a decent guy. He didn't take the Thomas Cook offer, or the VO5, or the hair care products, LMS, everything. Uh, he got his leave, and he went to a nearby resort with his wife and his kid, and had a holiday. But what that tells us is that everything now happens like that. Right? One push of a wrong send button destroys relationships, destroys your leadership, uh, you know, the respect you have, people have for you as a leader. So we have to always be constantly aware of what we're doing. And it's very scary. So I mentioned about the leadership that's required to navigate the 21st century. And we're seeing leadership coming out from very unexpected places. We see Greta Thunberg, a 16-year-old girl who probably has read the UNFCC report more than me and knows that by 2050, when she's adult, that she's going to be living in an unlivable world and decided that what's the point of going to school if I'm not going to be able to have a decent life? So on Fridays, goes out on strike and, and, and now millions of young people are going on strike. And then you see this woman uh, in Sudan who stood on a van and became a symbol of a quest for social justice and, 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 and you know, brought down a government. So Allah Salah was, was, played a very important role in that. But even closer to our region, um, we see that... Um, oh, my slides are running all over the place. Okay. The data is telling us that society expects CEOs to lead change. Whether we like it or not, if you're a leader, you are expected to lead that change. And this is why, you know, for us in many of the larger institutions, we have to start looking at, um, you know, how our community around us, closest to us, our people, are actually, you know, happy or unhappy, and what change they want to see. And you'll see on the right there, you know, all the different issues that people are asking for positive change, equal pay, prejudice, discrimination, training, environment becomes a very important issue for, for people. Uh, data, sexual harassment, fake news. We saw this in Jacinta Arden, right, who demonstrated a very different type of leadership style that encompasses empathy, <coughs> care, and integrity, which has resonated with people. And globally, leadership values lead to adapt. She's not the norm, unfortunately. We need much more diverse and inclusive leadership, as we mentioned, Elizabeth. And we need women's leadership in particular. With the, it'll be pivotal. Leadership where women and girls of all backgrounds, capabilities, and identities are emboldened and lead change. Leadership that encourages cultures of collaboration empathy, curiosity, innovation, bravery. Leadership that practices vulnerability and exposes you to vulnerability and recognizing that you are vulnerable as a leader. Giving up sharing power and promoting inclusive growth for all of us. I want to leave you with a couple of questions to ruminate and think about because I may not have the answers for you, but these are certainly questions you as leaders, you as people in organizations and institutions need to ask yourself. 
what are the leadership skills that are required? Do you have to be thinking? What's, what is the, how do we get women to lead in this 21st century? And how might existing power structures need to shift to embolden women's leadership in the future? I've become quite unpopular in Malaysia because I keep hitting out at male-only panels. But it makes me sick to think that in this day and age, we need to remind some of the organizers that male-only panels is not acceptable. How do we even embolden women to take steps in leadership? We don't even get their voices heard. So, the future is complex. Now more than ever. But as we look back, what do we have as an advantage as humanitarian organizations? What we have is our principles, our values. What we have is our stories. I could sit here and tell you a hundred stories and make you cry. And make me cry as well as problem. But I'll tell you maybe two. So, a woman in Africa, at Federation we do a lot of cash programming. We stop giving goods out. Because we believe cash is dignity and cash gives people affected by crisis choice and what they want. And believe me, they are trusted, they will do the right thing. And we followed the mother with a cash voucher, which is a small amount, to a shop. And we took a little bet among ourselves to say, what would she buy? Maybe flour, maybe some gram, maybe some beans, whatever. The first thing she reached out for was a bar of soap. The second thing she reached out for was a bottle of head lice shampoo. And she had very little left, and we were so surprised. So we asked her, why did you reach out for the soap and the head lice shampoo? not food. And she said, my children have not had a bath, a proper bath, for a long time. I need to make sure they're clean. They have head lice. I need to make sure that they get the head lice killed. Because only then can they mix with other children. Dignity is so important. And the people who have the least are the ones we never look to uphold their dignity first. So of course, the good side of the story is we all had to empty our pockets to make sure she got the flour, the rice, and everything else. But you know, the moral of the story is that, did we even think? I have 20 years experience. I never thought the first thing she would reach for was a bar of soap and head lice shampoo. But it just shows that we never think about it. The second story I will tell you is the story I promised Suha and Noor to tell everywhere I go. And Suha is an engineer, and Noor is a final year or something computer stu student. And they had to cross the ocean from Syria to safety, and they landed in, uh, in Greece. So I met them, and their husbands have managed to make it to Germany, but they're still stranded at the time when I met. And we talked to them, and, I, you know, and if, you, if you talk to them, you will never believe they're refugees. Never. Right? What did they do? They organized a community because people there were getting diarrheal diseases, the children. But they decided that they were going to do hygiene promotion, teach uh, people how to wash their hands, how to dispose of wastewater, make sure that drains are not clogged, and so on and so forth. So then, with their actions, the incidence of diarrhea dropped very drastically in the camp. At the time, there were snakes even running around the camp. But Suha and, and, and Nora said to me, I want people to know that we are not stupid. We had no intention to leave our countries. We fled because we, we were worried about our lives. So tell the world that we are very grateful we're very grateful, not just because of the assistance, but the opportunity to work in the camp and do voluntary work. They're, they're volunteers. 
and to be able to actually help the lives of other people who are probably in the same boat or worse than us. I have no idea where Suha and Noor are right now, but I tell this story because I want to remind myself and everyone I speak to that refugees are sometimes highly qualified people. They're very clever, they're very dignified, and they certainly do much more voluntary work than many people who have nothing to worry about. So, ladies and gentlemen, I've tried to paint you a picture of the future trends, the future challenges, and you may sound very, you may feel depressed right now, but you shouldn't be, because with every challenge lies an opportunity for us to do things differently. One, two, three. Hold, please. <laughs>